It's a very small service where basically the mental health teams were recognising lots of referrals coming through the adult world for um, ADHD, but they weren't commissioned to deal with it. Can I just start before, how many of you guys are here about kids and how many adults? Is it primarily? Adolescents. So a mixture. Main kid. Now I'm going to have to say, this is designed because I'm an adult psychiatrist to talk about adults primarily in terms of some aspects. But when we get to the medication bits, the same medication we use across all of it. And so we can talk about all aspects um, from that perspective, so that's fine. Um, but I'm going to come at it from an adult perspective for some of it in terms of the wider bits. So the generic bits are the same. But some bits, so the cases that I'm going to say as examples of what can be complicated and more adult cases, because that's what I see. Um, we will talk a little bit about transition as well, so those of you who said adolescence, that's going to be interesting to you, I suspect. Um, so that's where it's coming from to start with. Well, like I said, we started the adult service, the kids' service has been there for a long time, but where, what's happened is it's gone between CAMS and neurodevelopmental services, and how the pathway there has developed um, has been complicated by an attempt to try and put it in their neurodevelopmental umbrella, and then realising that the needs are far greater. Um, and we've had exactly the same thing in the adult service, is that the understanding of how much actually is out there is very limited in the commissioning world. Um, be careful what I say on that. Um, but, um, but it's true. Is that most people have underestimated how much of this is actually out there. Um, and I will quite happily go on record to say I think this is going to grow there in the next decade. Because effectively people are starting to realise that there's a lot that can be done. With ADHD especially, you can treat so much of it. With autism, for example, which is the most common overlap, you get that longitudinal difficulty which doesn't get treated. You treat symptoms around it, but you don't treat the core autism. With ADHD, actually, you can treat the core symptoms and you can massively improve quality of life and function for so many people, so it does make a difference. Now, where you get into the difficulties is where there are comorbid presentations. So you've got linked features. It complicates how it presents. And when we get to it, I'll talk to you a little bit about how some people as adults can describe what they're feeling, which doesn't come out in kids, which is where sometimes it might explain why you're seeing some difficulties and side effects, which they can't express themselves. But in the adult world, I've had some conversations where it's quite nice to get some feelings of, what, of some of that. Can I just ask a quick question about exactly. how, how ADHD, because we're quite new to it, how ADHD changes in its presentation from, and not in great detail, but from childhood to adult. Do, in adulthood, do, they, do, children, do the patients still have all the same problems? Um, similar. So it never goes away? It can go into remission. Um, and so what you tend to see is some of the features reducing their intensity, and so the effects on you can be less. Some people learn how to manage, and so the function goes away. Often what you see is the hyperactivity goes down most, but some of the inattention and the impulsivity remain, but we learn to manage it. And so it's called being remission rather than it's actually going gone away. But there is a whole, whole concept around actually there's an element of delayed maturation of the brain. And for some people, where your brain maturation is progressing, it just delays, it progresses later. And so there's about a third who will go into remission in adulthood. Um, and so not everybody continues, but a lot of people do. And so, you know, this is my big bugbear, is clearly when you're 17 and a half, you clearly have it, six months later, clearly it's all gone away. That's not true, that's rubbish. But, and, and that's where the drug licensing sometimes causes its problems in the adult world. It's one of the few places and the few um, conditions where kids have more options than adults. Um, and that's just one of those things. Um, and it's all to do with how much drug companies want to spend to take it through a licensing process, rather than there's no evidence for its effectiveness. So, um, we're going to blend it into different bits. First of all, I didn't know all people's backgrounds and how much you knew about it. This may be boring to everybody who knows anything about ADHD, but I'm going to start a little bit about history, not much, but a little bit about some basic concept around how it fits, how the phenomenology, the descriptions fit into a bigger world, and why there's overlaps. Then we'll look a little bit about sort of, uh, medication, how our service works, and then 
a few cases at the end to give you an idea of how it can be complicated. There are adult cases, um, because the adult world is different slightly, and that's my background with really working kids. Um, so the first thing to say is it, it is not a disorder that comes and goes, it's a chronic condition, um, and it impairs people even into adult life. Um, and it's linked to lots of other factors. So it's a vulnerability factor to many situations. So if you don't treat it, you end up with other psychological overlays. So you think about London, and you have the neurodevelopmental condition, and then layers of life. And if you are vulnerable to life, you know, you're more likely to experience subsequent difficulties. So identifying it and understanding the needs from a younger age which helps protect some of those wider life events and to actually to, to function. So imagine the person who is blamed, and so we will know about this because we've had a Twitter conversation about it, you're blamed for being um, a bad child, you're behaviourally disturbed, it's your fault for not behaving properly, whereas actually misunderstanding the fact that you're climbing under the desk is actually you need to move because you've got ADHD. And so that is such a common story that you hear from parents and it doesn't go away into adulthood is that you know the impulsivity that goes on is why they, they they can't hold the job down because they can't control what they say to somebody and then they get fired. But those are the kind of things that you see in the perpetuates you can see the links between how all these types of things work. But underlying all of that is the fact that this is a brain disorder. You know, other things can affect it. So your psychological state, how you feel, your mood, all influences the severity of the intensity of its presentation. But ultimately, this is a brain disorder. And the difference, as I said to start with, is unlike autism, where you're treating things symptomatically around the edge, for example, the anxiety or some of the other features related to it, here you can treat core symptoms. And lots of evidence from the MTA study back down have identified that the core features of, of ADHD are reduced through treatment. And that's important because this, it means that this is a condition you should be thinking about because there's a very clear pathway and model which you can implement which makes a difference. It doesn't mean you have to medicate, but a lot of people choose not to. But medication does work in these kind of situations and scenarios, and so we'll come back to that later. And very rarely is it just something like so, and there's a wider presentation of life and other things that go with it. And so there's a lot of overlap. Now, people used to say, well, this is a new condition. How have you come? We just discovered it in the late 1980s, and you guys are all making it up as you go along. They say that to us all the time. Um, but it's not. If you go back through history, you can identify cases where people have written about situations where when you look back and try and historically identify where it fits, you can put people into these boxes. Now, you can say the same for autism. I say the same for all these neurodevelopmental conditions. What has changed is that we have been able to recognise and put labels to them. That's the fundamental difference. Can you be able to access your slides? I think we have to be sent them. I'm happy to show them. Um, I've taken a couple of slides out because when I saw it here, it wasn't they were too small to read, but you can have it down there. Um, and so, yeah, so basically that's the thing. If you go back, you can start to identify that there are factors which are starting to be. So 1957, genetic impulsive disorder. How much does that sound like ADHD? You know, that is the, 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 the hyperactive impulsive subtype. You start to recognise the presentation. But then you start to get into the whole thing about attention being a part component of it and that aspect where you start to notice it. But it's really in the later DSM, the American Academy, that you start to define that. Now there's a, there's a separation in the 1980s between what is ICD, which is International Classification of Disease, which is a WHO manual that is used in Britain and around the world, compared to <coughs> the set and Diagnostic and Statistical Manual for Diagnosis, which is basically the American Psychiatric Association's own manual. So Americans have to do it differently. Um, for ADHD, it's actually they do it better. Um, and most of us who work in the ADHD world will use the DSM criteria, not the ICD, or have done up until now. We, we, the, the criteria in ICD-11 should be more similar, but it's not as well defined. And so we'll wait to see what that actually finally looks like. 
1987, DSM-3 is when you start to really get what we now understand as ADHD. And that's where we start to differentiate between those different factors. And that's where we start to recognize the rates go up. And in DSM-4, which came out in 1994, you've got a separation to what we now diagnose. And those of you who have got diagnosis since then, it'll be one of these three broad categories that you will have either combined type, inattentive subtype, or um, predominantly hyperactive impulsive. And most people who have the bottom one will have a degree of inattention, but we may be missing it, really. And so most people, that's why the code is the same for both. Because really the, the treatment and the angle and the aspects is the same. But that is effectively where it all sits. In 2013 was when the last update of these manuals came out. The only real change was they increased the age to 12. Now, if you talk to some of the group, the European group, who put it together, there was an argument for increasing, for adding in dis uh, behavioural disruption as one of the components, or increasing it to 15. But there are the evidence base for that is still limited. And so the only real change was to increase the minimum age to 12. Even that is contentious. Because if you're talking about developmental <coughs> condition, you should be able to identify these traits from a very early age. They may not be obvious or my identifiable, but if you look back, you should be able to identify traits of it. This is saying that you can go through life and enter into a secondary phase of critical development because your brain starts to mature again in that early puberty stage. Uh, which is why you will find that teenagers change massively over that period because their frontal lobes are maturing massively, which is your question about maturity. Um, that's why it's slightly contentious and why there isn't a consensus around that. So I think the 12 is where they agree the cut off. But there is a whole group where people talk about that pubertal development, should that be included up to that 15, 16 year old? That hasn't been defined. <coughs> so it's 12 at the moment. It used to be 7 which was very much more to do if you're thinking about infant secondary school and levels. And in America, seven is where they go to infant school. And so basically what we're defining is that it was before starting at school. This is now talk to talk about secondary school, effectively. So that's how it's kind of separated. So, the other thing you have to separate out is cause and outcome. Okay? So, when we talk about etiology, we're talking about the things that cause damage. Now, most disorders are genetic in their origin. And that's what you see with ADHD, is that it, there's a lot of genetic components to it. You will often see it in families that's often passed down, but not absolutely so. And so we also know there are environmental factors that can cause it as well. So there's a lot of teratogenic compounds that people can consume that can also lead to ADHD as an outcome, irrespective of your genetic makeup. So, can you explain what that means? Which, which bit? A big word with the compound. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, okay. Sorry. Um, you'll have to stop me when I say things like that. Teratogenic yeah. is where you basically. So, have you heard of thalidomide? Yes. Yes. So thalidomide is a teratogen. It's something that you consume when you're pregnant that can cause damage. So, your valpo is a common one that's been around the moment. I've worked with alcohol, and that's one of the things that you can work with. So, prenatal drugs, some of them can cause this kind of thing. So if you're taking something, that it can cause this kind of thing. What most people would suspect has to be in that period, a very early period that starts to cause damage to the brain, trauma afterwards does something different. It's a psychological effect. So the neurodevelopmental effects, you generally tend to see from very early age, but they may not become identifiable. And so if you've got a two-year-old who's running out slightly hyperactive, you're not going to say that they're abnormal. And my work was in a, in a and nursery, and so she's half the two year olds are in there, a bit hyperactive. Mm -hmm. So, you know, you're not going to say it too, but that is abnormal, um, especially the boys. The girls are quieter, so they're more distractible. And so, if you're quiet but distractible, you get missed. And that's when it comes down to the, how common it is in terms of that prevalence between them. But anything up to three and five percent of kids could have um, ADHD. And so if you take a classroom of 25 to 30 kids, usually one of them may well have an ADHD diagnosis. So it's not rare. You know, if you're seeing it that often, you know, there's a lot of these kids out there. But that isn't something that has been identified. As I said, two-thirds of them will progress into adulthood. That's a lot of adults out there. 
you know, when I grew up in the 1980s and when I was at school, you know, this was not thought of. You didn't get a diagnosis then, which is why there's so many adults now coming through, where actually we're now looking back and saying, I wonder if I had it. Quite often it's when your own kids get diagnosed. Is that the thing thing hold on, say, I'm like that. Um, Sorry, it's a bit of a back step. You know, you're talking about um, genetics and drugs that you can take during pregnancy and then trauma. Does that include birth trauma? Depends on the severity, but yes. Okay, but it has to be extremely severe. Okay. So if you have somebody who's got significant hypoxia, i.e. Mean, lack of oxygen, okay. in that early phase, they need time on the neonatal year for resuscitation, yeah, you can damage the brain. Okay. It's things that damage those brain pathways that cause that permanent that can't be overcome. And so that's what you're looking for. So that's either going to be genetic, so it's constantly mm -hmm. developing, or something that is basically damaging the process of normal development. Mm -hmm. okay? So you can get, so if, you're, if you've got brain injury, somebody's whacking across the head as a kid, then maybe you can get trauma, you can get that. But if it's just psychological, you know, that, the, the evidence is less tenuous. There's more and more evidence coming out that, it's, that it causes psychological damage, not the neurological damage in the same way. But that, again, is emerging kind of well. So, what Eric Taylor, who is Professor at Maudsley, did in, in the early 80s was he did a cluster analysis of symptoms and he did what's called a factor analysis. Does anybody know that is? So what you do is you take a whole bunch of symptoms and you use clever statistical methods and you try and work out which ones link to each other. And you try and do that by saying at the frequencies of these and mapping them together. And it's a statistical way of actually trying to pull this thing into some sort of conclusion. And so he did a factor analysis and he came up with the three core broad areas of one of those things, which is where we tend to start to get this idea from. I think it's out there. I won't go recording in case I've got that wrong. Um, but effectively, these are the three core areas that we talk about. Um, and so and that breaks down broadly into the three diagnostic categories of inattention, overactivity, and then the impulsivity. And that's what we're looking for. And DSM separates it out into nine, cri nine criteria for inattention, and then a separation of these two into a further nine domains. And that's what you're effectively looking for. And there is an overlap between all three, but it's never as simple as that. Because what we're trying to do here is to put people into boxes. And people don't like boxes because they're people, and they kind of fit where they want to fit. Um, and that's the big problem with this, is most people are a bit of A, some D, maybe a little bit of B, but no C. Or they may have lots of C, but no real B, but a bit of D and a bit of A. And so it's never as straightforward as you, an absolute. And when we use what's called a categorical approach, that you use a category and you have an absolute yes or no, it doesn't fit, because people, and that's why we debate around the edges, of is it or isn't it? When it's obvious, it's easy. Now, if you've got 90% of A, then you can pretty much say you've got something. But if you're 50-50 across different things, then how, do you, how are you going to plan for which one you're going to go for? And that's the challenge with some of this, is what people have tried to do, and you know, some of DSM, the criticism, is because it's the American market, it's about insurance companies, and putting them into the right bracket, so insurance companies will pay you for what you do. You know, we don't care about that in the NHS in a sense, as long as you can actually get the diagnosis that is, that's in there, that's, that's what you're worried about. But there is overlaps, and that's the thing. So, I'm going to try and highlight that by showing you some symptoms. Executive function is where your frontal lobes are working, okay? So, what we're showing here is thrown onto the screen randomly is some executive function sort of descriptors, okay? If I take all of those symptoms and cluster them in one way, and get core symptoms of ADHD. Inattention, hyperactivity, and positivity. They're out that this checklist. If I take exactly the same symptoms and cluster them another way, I get some core symptoms of autism. Exactly the same symptoms. Now, well, that's a good question. On the um, language deficits, that, that, that clustering, um, is that relating to written or speech? This is speech. Okay. Okay. But, and again, they're all separated out. So written is again different. 
often people will do better on written language than they will on expressive. And you can separate that out as well. So how people understand compared to how they speak is different. And so what you'll find often is a three-year-old or a five-year-old will speak often better than they actually fully comprehend. Because you have to give it at the level that they can understand sometimes and what they express themselves. And there is a difference. Um, but if you take this as a broad understanding, the point here is same symptoms, you've got autism, one mouth, ADHD, another one. DSM 4, so sorry, one, sorry. Yeah. you say you've got ADHD and autism. So the first one is ADHD. Yeah. And then the second one is autism, or is that still ADHD? No. Nope. Got them? Okay. No, no, we'll come back to that. Okay. What you've got here is all of these symptoms come from executive function. Front lobes of your brain, not working properly. They're all symptoms and descriptions. So inattention is just a symptom. Yeah? So if you cluster them, you get an ADHD. They're all coming from that frontal lobe, that description. Autism can come from a different part of that, so social communication pathways within that. Mm -hmm. So what I'm trying to get at here is that descriptions don't tell you about what's going on in the brain. Yeah? So these bits here, DSM-4 said you can't have both. Now that doesn't make sense if you use this approach. So DSM-5, which was the update, clearly says you can. So we now know that we do see an overlap. So in our animal group, about a third of that. Does that make sense? Yeah. And so that's the whole point. Now there's other bits here, which are other memory deficits, but they can present in both groups. So you may find people with ADHD are working memory deficits. You may find people with autism have that, because it lacks that bit of the brain that is dealing with that. But symptoms are limited in terms of how they do it. But that's how we make psychiatric diagnoses. There isn't a brain structure or a pathway that we can look at and say, you've got ADHD because you have this. Mm -hmm. If you do a scan of this function and you find the details, you may say it's more likely to fit with this, but it's not definitive. And so that's what we're trying to do. When we talk about these, this is just generally, it's only for illustration. <coughs> it gives you the idea. So we're really happy with that. <coughs> and that's important. So that's how we come to where we are now. And DSM-5 talks about um, these are the basic symptoms you have to have to get an ADHD diagnosis. So you have to have it for six months or more. The implication of that is it creates a longer term presentation. It's not just something you have for a short time. So you can get, for example, bipolar affective disorder, which is a psychiatric illness, which is time limited, and when you treat it, the symptoms go away. You may have a psychotic disorder or something else which presents like this, but it isn't this. So that six months is important in terms of extending and showing this there. Most of the kids who you see are going into adult people have had it most of their lives. And so, it's, so that's an easy category. You have to have six in each group for inattention and the hyperactivity and impulsivity. The only change there is that they dropped it to five in adult people because some of those symptoms decreased, especially the hyperactivity ones. And so they brought it down to five criteria in adult people, but only adult people because a child is still six and six. Again, as I said, 12, and this is the important thing. And if you've got these symptoms, but you can use it productively, and so you've got lots of energy and you're slightly out of practice, but you channel it, and it's not causing a functional deficit, you don't have a disorder. Now, this is where society and life can have an impact, because if you suddenly change, and this is where, where these things vary, is that your life situation changes, and therefore what you were doing isn't helpful anymore. Does that mean you've always had a disorder, or is that a fluctuating thing? You know, that's a debate. But effectively, that's why some people are not necessarily presenting. It has to cause an impairment in how you function to get that diagnosis. It also has to be in, a, in multiple settings. It can't just be in one place, because then you argue there's something about that place that's causing you to act in a manner. You have to see it in different places. Now, the intensity of it may change, and so you may be worse at work or worse at home, but you have to see the same traits. Now, one of the big problems that we've got as a child is 
so many of the diagnostic criteria rely on, on teacher reports as much as parent reports. Parents overestimate quite often, should teachers massively underestimate. If you read the qualitative statements of teachers' reports quite often, they will say statements that make this is clearly ADHD, then you read their screens and oh, there's nothing on there. And it's to do with the fact that some teachers don't want to label and they underestimate that. The problem you've got is if services require that, that can be a problem. Um, unfortunately, there is a screening approach which has to be done for some, in order because of the amount of effort the work goes into, and you're looking for the most severe cases. And it's not to do with there isn't an issue, it's to do with the severity of presentation sometimes. Um, and that's a challenge, because if people are underestimating it, they can it. Do you not think that a lot of children, I know this was certainly the case with my son, that in the school environment he really, really held it together and kept everything under control because he didn't want to upset his teachers and then would come home and then... It's like it. Oh, right, so I can then make bottle. Okay, yeah, absolutely. Which is quite common for kids with ADHD. Is that yeah. you do see that. Is that the, now, what you will often see is that they will, if they were being watched in the playground, or an instructor time, or more times where they, you will still see traits of it. Because what you're saying is that they're reducing it and containing it for periods, and that's hard work. But the other thing they're doing when they're coming home is they're napping. Mm -hmm. And so if you think about a child who is tired, you know, my kids when they're younger and grumpy little bits, and so effectively, um, for a couple of as well, <laughs> um, but effectively, that, that's, the, that's the fact. But it's also their safe place, isn't it, when they come home, but they yeah, know they that they can absolutely. Yeah, totally. kick off, if you like. Yeah, totally. And the other thing is that, you know, when they come home, is, especially the older they get, think about a brain that is inefficient, that isn't working properly, that has worked harder to do the same task. You know, when you're a kid, when you're four or five, you come home, you sit them down, you give them the milk, you give them biscuits, then you do whatever, then you go and do something else. You don't force them to do something else. Straight away. My teenagers had like, tonight swimming, so they would have been picked up from school, taken straight to swimming, um, then they would have gone straight dropped off the scales, and then they'd be picked up and back home. Um, they never stop. When do they have the break? Because a person who gets tired may well still need to have that pause before you go into the next thing. And that's how you can manage things from a non pharmacological approach, but it's understanding. And yes, they can hold it together, but once they're holding it together, uh, they're working hard, so they're getting all tired, so that's a little thing that we need to carry on. But it's complicated by other things. Now, this is a paper I wrote with Susan Young, who is lead the UCAM group. This is about how we modify the pathways for ADHD treatment based on report. So, I said, as I mentioned, I work with people with alcohol spectrum disorders, and so we're looking at how we modify that pathway based upon the cause of that presentation. And so, if you have a genetic cause, for instance, it's not about ADHD being one thing anymore. We understand there's a spectrum of presentation with some traits that differ between each of them, and the cause of that presentation will alter how it presents. There's probably more work been done on that in the ASD group, the autism group, but it's, the, it's pervasive as well. We do, so that's why we have a range of presentations with people having different types of ADHD. And bearing in mind what is causing it, you can modify a treatment pathway. And so it's, it's basically trying to say you have to think increasingly about that as much as what the outcome is because it's changing what you do. Okay, any questions about the fundamental things? Can you have to tell us how you change the approach depending on... We're going to talk about medication generally. It's not for me to tell you about specifics. No, I mean, if you send the genetics or uh, like the, yeah, yeah, is the that's, approach that's, different? I'm not going to tell you okay. detail about everything. Okay. That would be too massive. And so if you take FASD, it's environmental stuff. First, if you have more overlap, you make sure you've the scene first. If it was, um, for example, we know that somewhere it's ASD overlap, and they use this next first rather than the third. It's that kind of stuff. And hard. so it's about choosing the, the approach. But we'll talk a little about lifestyle and choices when we get onto medication. Mm -hmm. Kids are different to adults because you're going to have different lifestyle choices. Um, and so Again, it will differ based on some of those kind of aspects. But we'll talk a little bit about how you choose which medication to use at which point in time when we get there. 
Okay, well, again, sorry, exactly. So, you've mentioned a few times about lifestyle choices. Yeah. What are you referring to here? You're referring to vocational choices, but what are you referring to? Or you're doing something, for example, where you have a slow start to the day and then it kicks off in the afternoon, compared to something else to be on it straight off. Mm -hmm. you know, some people's day will start at 7 and finish at 7. Well, actually, even the long acting drugs aren't going to work, so which one are you going to choose? It's that kind of stuff. Is As a child, you know you go to school at uh, half eight and you finish by three. Yeah. yeah? That's pretty always the case. So that's what your drug has to cover for the most of it. For an adult it's totally different. Mm -hmm. And we're, that's when we're talking about lifestyle choices. Okay. Okay, so this is next bit about what we've got. So these are the services that Surrey Waters has. And so you've got the SIPS pathway which is the behavioural and emotional needs pathway. And that's pretty much um, what we designed to do. Now that basically got in, didn't work as well as they thought it would, so it got embedded into main um, canteen. So up to the age of six, you will go and you will see a pediatrician. After the age of six, you will get into a pediatrician. Uh, uh, I'm on the National Fetal Alcohol Spectrum Source Service, which is lifespan, and then we are adult services across Portland, Hampshire, and so on. And so for both autism and ADHD, we run that. And other than the SIPs, they're kind of fully really broad. How many people come in the area? Huh? How many staff come in the area? Staff, not many. Not enough. Um, so when we started in Surrey, there was, for autism, there was me for half a day a week, and a two days a week of a practitioner. For ADHD, there was two days a week of Paul, who's one of our ADHD practitioners, and effectively half a day of consultant time. That's it. Now? Now we have, uh, in ADHD, we've got in Surrey, let's do across both, we've got roughly one consultant full time, and four ADHD practitioners. And that's across a 2.5 million population. That's how it works. That's how it works. Kids, kids, I can't tell you. <laughs> that's just how it works. That's just, I can't tell you for, 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 for kids because I don't do kids. Um, so, not in terms of delivery service, but there's not enough. There's nowhere near enough compared to it. If we look at sort of what we've got in terms of referrals, actually, this is our map. You've um, <coughs> never seen that. In fact, if you come on the screen, um, if there's no ADHD, obviously you're discharged, you go through, you can't give the therapy because you haven't got enough money for that, uh, and you go through that. That's just the problem with it. And um, eventually, you get to a point where you are discharged because to primary care, uh, because you have to have an out. Any care pathway has to have an out, otherwise you don't get any more in. And that is the big challenge of this. You can't get primary care on Why do you look at me then? Because we've had a conversation, haven't we? Um, but effectively, and I'm going to say it if you haven't said it, but you know, there is an out, there has to be an out. And that's the challenge with all of this, is to keep that flowing. And Kansas is no different, is you need to have energy, you need to stabilise, but then you need to have follow up. The difference with Kansas compared to um, adults, for example, they're still growing, there's still a lot of other side effects from that that has to be monitored. Um, but there are shared care ways that we can do so. Do you cover therapy later, like alternative? Psychological therapy is not in detail. No. Um, I'll mention them yeah. as that they exist, yeah. But, yeah. They, but I'm not talking about them. Yeah. Yeah. If you get a situation where you get even a notification of mine, you find like on the phone like this, does that continue to be effective at that dose of, you know, as of night? Um, yes, no. Um, so, if you find a dose that works for you, and dysfunction of what you want to do, and there is no other stresses in life and other factors going on, then the answer is that you can stay stable for many people. But there are some people where it starts to lose its effectiveness. And, but one of the things I question sometimes, and have to challenge again to look at, is what else is going on first? Because what you'll say is, it works got really busy and stress, so I'm getting really feeling really bad. Actually, how much of that is your ADHD change, and how much of it is your mood levels? Uh, because actually, concentration and 
kind of thing is to do with mood disorders as much as it is ADHD. And so it might not be your ADHD's got this. So it's not as simple as, you know, but people will come and say, my ADHD's got this. It might not be. And so it's never a straightforward presentation. You know, again, the kids, remember on exam time, you know, they may find that when there's no pressure, you need less pressure compared to when there's loads of pressure on somebody because you're having to work on and concentrate more and demand a place that makes it feel worse. The question is, do you then increase it and it stays with a higher dose? Well, actually, you don't need that for that participant. And that's the problem, is, is making those balances and decisions. And that's the art of it. You can't ever like, decide in a definitive way. You're trying to work out. There's also women with hormones as well. I can't say that. I get to trouble for saying that. No, but no, you know what I mean. Like certain times of the month, you do have to adjust your medication. It doesn't work. It does. And so what I'd rather people do, if I trust them, and trust is a big thing, because we do have people, especially out of the who are selling it, um, and you know, that's, that's a real issue. Um, if we can trust the individual, what I'd rather do with people is to give them top-ups, is that you'll have a regular lower dose, but I trust you to have occasional top-ups of immediate release to use for those occasions when you need a little bit extra. Because that's far better than having increasing the per lower dose and always having to have the higher dose because you get more side effects. You know? And so there is a balance to all of this as to how you do it. But again, with kids, it's hard because actually there's other things going on. You know, teenagers, my 15-year-old's seems to be the counsel to all his friends. But they're all having issues because they all go through that period and they're trying to work out who the hell they are. Um, everybody's got emotional distress. And so that then starts to kick in as to the other factors that are affecting their wider treatment. It's quite tricky at the second like kids in puberty because don't come in so up and down as a kid in puberty. Yeah, you don't know. It's not just the it's a massive change. You know, you're you're awash with lots of stuff. The serotonin is changing differently. You know, you've got loads of this there. This is affecting the normal nervous system, as we'll see in a second. That's about quite a uh, quite a uh, But let's pause that in a second. It's still quite a flight. So, can you kind of advise to, to to help that alongside like, to more meditation and things like that, which you can't engage in it. I think it works better for those adolescents and adults. Is they keeping their fight or flight levels yeah. up, you know? No, 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 no it's not, that's not the way. Fight or flight is how you treat it. So let's come on to that, because it's a, it's, it's a weird analogy, but that's what we'll do. Um, right, we'll come so on almost that. that could be counterproductive. Yeah. So, yeah, so depends, you're trying to, yeah. So the answer is it depends. Let's come on to that, because if I explain what we'll do when we treat it, why? What you're doing is de-escalating arousal. Yeah. Okay. And arousal and stress is a big component that makes you feel and experience it more. So it's not a bad thing, but it's not how we treat it with medication. Mm. It's slightly different. Uh, right. So this is the process. You get you get different plants. So what we thought um, stupidly, and we thought we'd do it quickly, is that we've had two pathways. The people who are new to the service, the ones with a no diagnosis or even less, do a lot of assessment, those who've been diagnosed before but were new to us, and so you'd hope that they'd have a good assessment and you could just take them through quickly. They never do. Um, and then the follow up ones, where you're just transferring. The problem is, they get so clogged up so quickly that you can't get anybody into it. But they're all sitting in the blue boxes waiting to get into the orange because you know, they're clogged. Yeah. Um, this was the back of the so This was the referral when we started our Hampshire so we always did in Paris. And you can see 128 cases in the first month. How many cases do you think we were commissioned for for the whole year in Hampshire that first year? 13. 13. 100. So within less than a month, we had a year's waiting list. That's how it works. We had a thousand referrals in year one. We are now in Surrey and Hampshire getting close to 100 referrals per month for the adult service. Kids service is exactly the same. 
because it's across the different patches. At least you have different teams so you can see them. But the referral rates are nuts, basically. And that, what about referrals? How many actually actually on five nurses? Is it um, GPs and parents saying, hey, shut them your way and you deal with it? Or is it actually from, from the percentage going through? Well, I can't remember the percentage rate. It's, 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 it's about 60 or 70 percent at least, if not higher. And so some of it is people who send it away. Um, a lot of them do, but I can't tell you the exact percentage rate. I'll have to look that up. It's a good point. But, um, but it's the autism one I know better. That one from that, we're getting about a 45, no, 55 60% diagnostic rate of that. The ADHD, I think, is slightly higher, but I can't tell you exactly. Um, the other thing we've got is a transitions factor, where we have meetings with the CAMS teams to try and make it as smooth as possible. What we have is we want to try and make it so if you're in the system, that you have a transitions meeting and then it transfers across immediately smooth for the whole thing. The problem is the animal world is very different to the child world. And the biggest thing that you will often find, and um, I'd be interested to hear what you find from your support groups, is when they turn 18, they lose all the background and support. Um, and that what you find is just because you lose the education side, you've got to go to work, there's an expectation that society demands you at 18 suddenly to be able to do everything for yourself. Um, and that ain't how these kids work. You know, their maturity is delayed. But their executive function, their function load, are maturing at a slower rate compared to other people. And so they are ready, from a developmental point of view, to just suddenly, when they turn 18 on that day, which is a society defined point, to suddenly be able to do it all. What's the taking to have true, like, chronological age if you've got a developmental delay? Learning yeah. Because, yeah, say you're 16, but you're actually functioning like a 10-year-old. You can't be. That you should still be treated as a 10-year-old, in that sense. No, that's not how no, the law does it. I'm just joking. No, the law doesn't do that. So, until you turn 18, you as a parent no longer can make any decisions for them. They have, they have deemed to have capacity. If they don't have capacity, you have to prove they don't have capacity. And you as a parent can assent. So you can say what you think, but ultimately it's the best interest of that, that, that individual. And if there's a discrepancy of view, then it's important to decide. That's the, that's the issue about being an adult compared to a child. Up to the age of 16, and in some cases 14 for certain things, you as a parent can make most of the decision when you think of that child. 16 to 18 depends on, it's kind of a grey area, but you can generally influence more, but forget the eternity. Unless that person has absolute lack of capacity, an intellectual disability of a moderate to severe range, there's a good chance that they will have to make decisions. Which is why you see people with intellectual disability turn 18 suddenly realise that parents can't tell them what to do anymore and they kick it off. And they kick back against people where they felt the restrictions. You see it loads of time. You're not allowed to smoke, so you suddenly start smoking and stuff when you turn 18. Because you can think that. Well, things like that happen. Um, because of that pushback. But from our transitions point, what we're doing is that we will take the referral from 17 and a half, because really the waiting time with the most counts team would be more than that. We need certain bits of information to be transferred, and this is what I mean about those diagnoses before, where you hope that information is there. So for example, if you've been done an online one, half the time all you have is a letter saying you have ADHD. How is that helpful? My practitioners did kill me if, I, uh, if our practice doesn't tell them from our service what they're doing. Some of the doctors are trying to get them to behave, but they don't. Um, but he's trying to get them to put in enough information. Because what we want to know is if we give you this medication, which symptoms are getting better? I don't know what your profile is. How do I do that? And just to say you've got ADHD is not enough. We need to know what effects you, what medication, what side effects do you have, some of that kind of information to show you how to continue that, otherwise you pretty much start from scratch. And that's where it's often missing uh, when it transitions to us and we plan with them. But having the transitions needed to facilitate that is more important. So that's some of the same things that we start with. As I've shown you, the rates are high, um, and they we'll continue to be high. Um, we've got in the adult a lot in the child pathway, QB test access. Now, this is not a diagnostic tool. 
uh, in the sense that it's a standalone tool that tells you how to do it. It is a diagnostic support tool where it gives you indications that will allow you to help support the diagnostic process. And that's what we try to do with all of this, is try to work out where some of this fits. Because what we're doing is, when we think about a medical model, you take a history, you do an examination, you do some investigations, then you treat. Give you an example. You've got a cough. You don't know what the cough is, you go to see a GP, the GP takes some questions, listens to your chest, sends you for an x-ray, does a sputum culture, works out which bug it is, gives you the right antibiotic. That's medical model. What we're doing is we're taking history, do a mental state examination, looking at wider stuff, but what most psychiatrists never do is an investigation stage. But there aren't many investigations that we can do. The QB, what it allows us to do is where is a grey scale, you know, like where there's boundaries, where it's unclear. We can do some of this investigation to try and work it out. Um, um, so one of the things that we will do is this. What you have is a standard approach where you will... What the chalky ones have gone? What were they? Um, you, stand, you sit by a, a computer and it's a 20 minute long test uh, designed to challenge you over that period. Because what it's looking for is people can hold it together for a period but it's most people, and I'm saying most people because it's not everybody, who, who will struggle for the 20 whole minutes. And so you'll often see they do well, first five, maybe 10 minutes, but 15 and 20 minute phase, you'll see more of the issues. We had somebody the other day who had an IQ of about 130, 140, who held it together for the entire time. So people can, which is why it's not a diagnostic tool. It is a support tool, but you have to take the whole context of what is going on. What it does, the ball is looking at your movement, and it's got a camera which is a meter away from the head, and it's looking and registering the movement. And what you have are two different tests: of so an inhibitory control test and a continuous performance test. And it's looking about inclusion and exclusion factors, and you get results of it like this. You can't see it that well. But what you've got, this is the <coughs> motion of the head, so you can see it's quite squiggly, and this is the number of areas where they press it all over the place at the wrong time. You can see when treated, it goes down massively. And so the squiggles, this same person, the squiggles go down massively, and the green and the red dots are in roughly where you expect them to be. It shows the treatment works. It is a support tool, and it's quite nice. We use it in one of two ways. We use it broadly for a diagnostic clarification, where we have cases where we're not 100 percent sure. It's not used in the child service here, it is used because of the expanse of it. It is used in the adult. Um, but we use it for that. But also we use it for treatment adherence measures. And so if we were to, if we're not sure it's working, we will ask you to come unmedicated to do the test, to take the medication, and then see what it does. That allows us to see the benefits that medication is doing on a direct test. And there are people who, um, in some cases, we're not certain about whether they're taking the medication properly or what effect it's having because they're not good, reliable historians of what they're telling us. You know, because it's so much dependent on what you tell us as to what we can do. This is an objective way of looking at that. And for some people, we have to do that. But it hides which way you're going. What we have is a Luke is our practice, one of our uh, support workers who actually is, who does this. He runs a QB clinic once a week, and we get people to go there. As a specialist service, we have a few people who go above standard rates. <coughs> so the BNF, which is the British National Formulary, which is our drug bible, medication bible, not drug bible. Um, tells us what the maximum rates are and what you should be prescribing you have. There are some people who have to go above that level to get effectiveness because of how the brains work. Now, that is a small proportion, but sometimes you have to do it. In a child world, I would never do that because they can't consent. But as we'll show you later on, in an adult world, in a discussion, we can do that more easily. 
Do you find there are any particular characteristics of that group that need a higher? It, it, it's quite varied. There's no. Um, it's not straightforward. It's not no. something. Well, it's not been found yet. Well, it's not something you can walk through doors. I'm going to tell you you're going to have a higher dose. It doesn't work. No, no, but like seeing that you find over time that. I don't think that there's no, people that. Maybe you're sub. Okay. So of. my gut tells me that there are other things sometimes going on. What the descriptors are that they're given doesn't fit with that. Mm. And so what you suspect and what you can prove are two things. <coughs> so there's one guy who's on a quite high dose, who's slightly inconsistent, doesn't tell his stuff, he's doing QB as well. Um, but, you know, is he responding or not? It's very difficult to tell. And there are a small proportion, I've both spoken to Phil Ashton, who's the professor at the Morton and other people, and there is a small proportion of people who do need more. Working that out isn't, until you test it, it's difficult to say. We will go above that level with consent. So in the same way, if you go for operation, you have to sign a form saying, I understand that there's risks, I understand blah, blah, blah. We do the same thing, so we will get you to sign a consent form to say that this is going above what is proven safety. And if medication doesn't work, does that, is that best basically pushed in the diagnosis? No. It might, but it just may mean that you end up like right medication. It's, it's not straightforward. Some people respond differently to other things. Can I ask you a question on the QB test? Because mm -hmm. um, we talk about adult mental health here. Um, so for, the, for children, if, if for example your child's struggling at school, um, and they don't know which areas they're not able to concentrate on, they might be simplifying it too much. Um, are, are children able to get access to a QB test, whether it's privately or through the NHS? Privately, in, in sorry, yes. Mm -hmm. um, sorry, have, kids serve seven balls. You can do it privately. If you find something, you'll do it, yeah. Okay. And then the other point you're making around the IQ test, um, IQ. So, so, sorry, child's IQ or adult's IQ, mm -hmm. what's the QB? How, how are you determining which bit? I don't think bit? I said about IQ, though. No? You, you so I'm talking about someone with a higher IQ could probably oh, do okay. yeah. maintain yeah. 20 minutes okay. more easily. Cool. Yeah. Yeah. So, so my question is, how do you do it? Do, you, do, do the people going through through the QB test think it's an IQ test first? Okay. Okay. That's just an example. Is that he, it's people who have are able to concentrate and hold it together more. You, what you find is that quite often people with higher IQ they can focus, hyper-focus in a way, so that's how they've got the, their exams, that's why they've got into mm -hmm. different situations, that's why they are achieving, but if you put them in the wrong situation, they don't. So this guy, you can see his life in other ways falling apart, blah, 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 but, you know, he's, he's been senior architect in this that thing, really intelligent guy, has got to, got to one, to one first class degree, so he's obviously held together, but then starts to struggle, not concentrate, blah, blah, blah. But for a 20 minute period, you can all together. It's not a correlation between identical, just because you have a high IQ, you can do it. And, and just on the life pathway, so I'm going back on this, as a child goes through different life experiences, if they experience a traumatic event, whether it be bullied at school or a relationship breakdown with a girlfriend, whatever it might be as they go through life, can that then present the uh, or trigger more aggressive forms of ADHD or, or not? No, I wouldn't even say it's ADHD then. Let's say you're going through a emotional breakout. Okay. You know, if you have an adjustment disorder because you broke up with your girlfriend, well, you've got an adjustment disorder because you broke up with your girlfriend. Mm -hmm. You know, to be fair, you know, that's not necessarily ADHD. Your symptoms may become more obvious because you've got an emotional component related to something else. Life happens. Yeah, yeah. And, and that's the thing. And so, what you have to be careful of doing is attributing everything. To ADHD. That's why I'm asking the question. When it might not be. Yeah, yeah. And so that's where you have to pull it apart. Okay. Um, and so what you this is the whole point, is that what you do is you come to me and you say, right, sort of, you know, he's had this thing going on, his ADHD isn't working, right, let's put him up on a bigger dose. It may help you concentrate a bit more, but then when life gets better, you're stuck on a higher dose. And that's because you're addicted, you become more dependent. Not about addiction. It's yeah. about the fact that you're on a higher dose, because I put you on a higher dose thinking you need it. Right, okay. No, you know, we're, we are based on what you tell us. Mm -hmm. And so that's why you have to be careful. And people at my level need to be asking the right questions mm -hmm. to say, is this the fact that you've broken up with your girlfriend yeah. and actually you need help to get over that? Mm -hmm. 
and I'm not going to put your medication up until you've dealt with that bit of it. Mm. You see what I mean? Yeah. Um, is that's what you're looking at. And treat the, the, the thing that you need treating. Not everything's to do with one thing. It might be, but it might not be. And that's what we have to do, is to try and work it out. And sometimes people come to us and say, it was working fine, but it's not now. All right, what's going on in your life? Not, let's just put the medication up. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, like I said, I am primarily an adult, so I'm going to focus a little bit on that. Right, how much you get older? Because you start to see more psychiatric over. So it's trauma and life happens more. Mm -hmm. Your experience of other things starts to be greater. Your, your, your expectation for you to be able to function on your own as an independent person becomes greater. You know, without the resilience and resource to do it. The demands, as you were saying, when you turn 18 and all of a sudden you're expected to be able to manage, well, it doesn't work like that. You know, the people who've got scaffolding and support do better. Well, capacity and consent becomes a real issue. <coughs> as a parent, at the point you turn 18, you definitely cannot consent. They are adults, they have their choice to make for themselves. And that's where they often will get things functioning. As I said to you before, people are, they do different shifts, mm -hmm. they do different work patterns. It's not a standard set 8 o'clock, 8.30 or 3.30. You know, people may have different timings where they need the medication. You know, it's, it's not a consistent thing. Um, when you get older, you start taking other things. You may be on the pill. You, know, you may be taking uh, antidepressants, which most kids are not taking. You know, there are other things that start to happen that you will start to have that causes complications. So somebody who's on an antidepressant, you know, there is a theoretical risk of what's called serotonergic syndrome, which is where your body basically starts to shut down, you get high temperatures, your body breaks down, it's not functioning properly. And that's a theoretical risk when you're on an antidepressant and stimulant. It's very rare, it's, most, it's an older type of drug that does it most commonly, but you have to be aware of it. So the more things that you're taking, the more complications that you have. If you have high blood pressure, are uh, that is physical health risks, that can stop you having I mean, it. Look at that with one of the, the, the cases that we look at. You're not worried about growing so much, because generally by the time you're 18, most people are fully grown, broadly. <coughs> they do, however, have things like heart problems, which kids often don't. Kids. This is from the uh, uh, medicine to, to hope with ADHD and cause heart problems. Yeah, no, well, no, they can. But, you know, as you get older, whether you like it or not, you're more likely to have heart problems. And no, so, but what I'm saying is the drugs you're taking to go into adulthood, they are more likely to trigger or exasperate the particular issues. Yeah, they, they put your blood pressure up. And so if you've got cardiac problems, mm then and your blood pressure is affecting your cardiac system then you're going to have an extra risk factor for heart attack strokes that's the problem and that, and that, that kind of kick in in terms of aging process no one built differently but is it going to in the 50s, 60s or is it younger than that? depends on your physiology so I've seen people one of my first days when I was working in casualty a 45 year old came with an MI and dropped it on the table you know, it doesn't hit it's not a straightforward. Some people have risk factors. You know, my granddad smoked like a chimney until his late mid 80s and had no problems at all. Mm -hmm. you know, it really varies. Um, and so you can't say it's about individual differences. But what I know, and we're going to come on to in a second, is that the drugs and how they work can put your blood pressure up. Now, if you are getting older and you have problems with your own blood pressure, which happens more as you get older, you know, we expand in the wrong way, ways and you don't want to do. You know, you, you're not as active, my knees don't take, so I can't do sports to the same extent I used to when I was a kid. You know, you're not as fit as you were. Those factors influence your risk. I suppose that with everything, if you make good life, lifestyle choice, choice mm -hmm. your food and diet and exercise, that blood pressure is the point. Absolutely, the but that, that affects my decision making. So that, as a child, child you're worried about growth, you're worried about basically those kind of factors sleep, those kind of more. When I get into adulthood and we're thinking about your physical health issue, 
as all these other things that start to come into play. And you're adding from 18 to when you're dead. And that could be three figures for some people. Future, we've got that history, and so you forget it. What's lost is that actually the detail of that. If you're coming in in your 30s, and you're coming on your own, and we're asking about when you were a kid, and you can't remember. And you're now to the oldest, but the same with you, you had the oldest person you had was 82. Um, everybody else was dead, but he needed to understand his life. <coughs> That's fair enough. Now, we wouldn't treat the 82 year old with ADHD, but we have had people in their 60s coming for the first time for assessment because they've always struggled and they've had these symptoms they want to know and they want to see if we can make it better for that next phase of the life. Um, that's the factor. They can communicate with us. You know, most adults are going to talk to us and tell us how they feel. You know, a three or four year old isn't going to be able to do that. Even a ten year old isn't going to do that properly. So it's dependent on objective assessments rather than a subjective experience. You can tell me as an adult, you know, I feel really restless. No, I can never sit still. Whereas a kid, you have to observe that. Why are they not sitting still? My wife will tell you I don't sit still, it's because I'm bored. You know, I want to sit down and do something, but I can't do it. You get me to sit down and do something I want to do, I'll sit there for hours. But that's different, that isn't ADHD. That's being bored. And there's a difference. And that's what you have to differentiate. So that, as much as she might like to medicate, but she doesn't. Um, but the point being, is that I'm not going to medicate somebody just because they're bored. That's the difference you have to put up. The capacity is an important factor. It allows you, in some ways, to do more as an adult than you can as a child. Because you have a chance to decide what you want to do. And we'll see in one of the cases with a cardiac case, where normally you wouldn't touch him with a barge but we did. Because we had a long discussion, we came to an agreement, signed a mutual consent form, and we took a risk. With the person's knowledge, what that risk would entail. And so you can do more with adults than you can with kids. I wouldn't do that with a kid because you're not making a decision for them. And so you go to a point, the first rule of medicine is don't do any harm. And if you are going to do harm to plants and potentially, they have to decide whether they want to buy it. And so that's, that's a decision making that we can do now, which you wouldn't have necessarily in a childhood situation. So within kids, you stick, I would always stick within the rules of what has been proven to be safe. Some people may get beyond it, but I don't. Yes, I will with that. Okay, so this is talking now about the next bits about medication and how we what it's about. Any issues or any questions so far about that? I know we've been asking you very much. No? So, this is what we're doing. Okay? What we're trying to modulate effectively is, so this is a synapse. And so what you have a nerve cell coming down, and you're, you have a, the synapse <coughs> end at the end. And what you do is you're trying to transfer signals from one point to another. They upregulate and downregulate the next cell, and that's how information is passed in nerve cells. Okay? That's the simplistic view. What we are trying to do is to modify your sympathetic nervous system. That is your fight and flight. So you have two basic nervous systems in your body. It's more complicated now, but the basic ones, what's called your sympathetic and parasympathetic nervous system. One calms you down, one alerts you. Okay? So, simplistic terms, your sympathetic nervous system is how you run away from dinosaurs who are trying to eat you. Um, and your, your parasympathetic one is what calms you down after you've stopped running away. That's the simplistic view of it. Your, the reason why people get panic attacks to spiders is that they have a psychological overreaction to the spider, which is going to do nothing to them. No comment. Um, I didn't see that one. Um, you can have words later. Um, but, the, but that is a psychological reaction because it's setting off a parasympathetic nervous system in terms of fight or flight. Okay? What you're doing when your fight or flight kicks in is you're more alert, you're tense, 
you're ready to go, and you're working out what's going to be concentrating or in case there's something coming to do it. And so what you're trying to do with this is to modulate that system, and so you can concentrate more, you're not so active because you're waiting to try and function and see what's going on. So that's the system you're trying to modulate. And so we look at noradrenaline, which is, a, which is similar to adrenaline, which is doing the same thing. Now, it it's, it's feels weird that you're going to modulate that because you'd expect it to be the other way around. But what you're trying to do is to make that bit work and make you more alert and more concentrated as a result. But it can make you feel more tense, which is a side effect. There's no such thing as side effects, it's just effect. But that tense is interpreted by some people as being negative. That's under medication or without medication? Sorry? That's under medication. Without without medication. medication. So you, you're, you're stimulating them to be more alert? So you're stimulating them to concentrate, to calm down in the sense of activity because you're ready. And that's what you see as a reaction to that. But the flip side of it is because it's affecting the sympathetic nervous system, the ones that's fight or flight, it can make you feel more tense and slightly agitated because it's making you aroused. Yes, so if this is doing the, the job saying, I think most people here have got children that had left them to school, so it gets them to be more able to concentrate because they're more alert and more ready, but should they walk out to the, out to the playground and someone in effect pushes them or picks them on, they or, might do. The, the, the chances are that your child, under normal circumstances, may not react, but with this medication because they're more alert, the chances are you're going to trigger a reaction? Not necessarily. So some people are, can, can, can inhibit their reaction because of the factors that, that this works like that. You, it's, it's, not a simple, it's not as straightforward as simple as, like I said, things aren't absolute. So yes, if you're agitated and you're behaviourally disturbed, it can do that mm -hmm. in some. And what you see in those people who are most vulnerable, the people who've got those comorbidities, and so if you've got an autism overlap and you've got neural irritation and you can't manage that irritation as well, you're more likely to react. Whereas a person who's more in control, less impulsive, may be able to walk away from a situation because they're not so disturbed. So it's not as simple or absolute in that okay. kind of way. You know, an adult, this is where an adult described for me recently about, we wanted to get to see if we could prescribe cannabis um, for it. And we've said no. Because now there is trials going on in Australia which is showing some good benefits. <coughs> and if, we, if there's evidence for it and we're allowed to prescribe it, I'll prescribe it. But at the moment we're not. The difference what he described was quite interesting. He said, I've tried methyl it slows me down, helps me concentrate, but I feel like I've still got a hamster wheel going around in my head and it doesn't really ever settle. Except when I use cannabis, it slows me down but also calms me down. And so for him, and his description of it, was that's the difference between what it does. Now cannabis has two parts to it. There's THC components, which makes you psychotic, and then there's cannabis oils, which you can get from every um, drive-through drive -through petrol station that you want to nowadays, apparently, um, that actually is not so toxic, which is why it's a, 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 a herbal remedy you can get from Holland and Barrett. And people are increasingly looking at it. The evidence base is still currently limited. But that description is quite nice in terms of that agitation and stress that's still going on, even though they are calm and able to concentrate more. And that's to do with that parasympathetic nervous system that's being affected here. It's kind of just works in a different way. This is affecting the sympathetic nervous system, making you more concentrated, slowing you down, but still causing agitation because you're tense. That's, that's the perception of it. Now, that's how most of the drugs work in terms of methylphenidates, dexamphetamines, even atomoxetine is working indirectly on that. The only one that works differently is guanfacine and clonidine in kids. Guanfacine is licensed, but that is working on a different pathway and has an indirect effect. So it's still doing it, but not as, so it's not as efficacious, not as effective, but because it works in a different way, it has a calming effect. So it's different. And so you will choose some of these medications for different scenarios. And so, for example, if you have somebody who is getting agitated on the stimulant, you may want to use the other medication because it has less of that agitating feature to it. And so there's a balance to strike sometimes between what we're trying to do. 
But effectively, that is what we do. We only have five drugs. That is it. Now, there's, not, there's no more than that. And so when we're looking at it, come back to a second. Alright, so this is now talking about how we make the choices and how, what we're trying to do. And I'm going to use paracetamol, because most of you are familiar with paracetamol as an example, but it works pretty much the same way. If you take a paracetamol, how many of you how many of you take a paracetamol? Everybody. When you take paracetamol, does it work instantly? No. Take about half an hour? Yeah. This is the time of taking to one set. Okay? So what you're trying to look at is when you take a drug, it goes into your system and it starts to build up in your bloodstream. And there will be a minimum <coughs> concentration you have to get to for it to be effective. But it won't be out of your system until it's over here. So what you have is this bit of the curve is where it's being working. That's what we're trying to get to when we're doing this. When we're trying to tailor your medication to a dose, versus timing. What you're trying to do is to get this bit to last as long as you can. Now, you may get side effects for the whole time because they're more sensitive than they are to other therapeutic effectors. And so as long as it's in your system, you may be getting some effects, but you're not getting the benefits because that's only that little bit there. And so what you see you know, when you're taking descriptions, and again with adults it's easy sometimes, they can, they can describe it for you, is what they'll say to you is, is it kicked off, took a little while to get going, but then it was working for a little bit, and after about half an hour it wore, wore off. What you then say is, okay, let's increase the dose, and so this bit is above the line for longer. That's what you're trying to do, is that you're taking the descriptions that people give you to try and work out what's going on with an understanding of how it works. Now, again, because it's a sympathetic nervous system, because you're tense, it's also tensing up and increasing your blood pressure. Blood pressure is about how much work your, and resistance your, your part is pumping against compared to what the baseline resistance is where it's relaxed. The systolic is how much it's squeezing against, diastolic is what the resting pressure is. That's what it is when you're taking blood pressure. So the higher they are, the more resistance there is around the system. Um, and the higher it is, the more likely small blood vessels are going to go pop. That's why you have to keep your blood pressure within a safe level, because you end up with strokes. You, know, you don't want to die from that. And, and that's what can happen if you push it too hard. And so that's the risk, which is why these drugs are thought to have roughly, in those people who are vulnerable, a 10% increase in blood pressure which is why you have to monitor it. Now, it doesn't happen to everybody, but it is something that you have to think about. And if you have other factors, you have to really bear in mind what's going on. But, as we'll come to in the case I'm going to talk about, it's not as simple as that. There it is. If you take a second drug, and so with immediate release, or you're taking a second paracetamol, what happens is, as that tail is coming down, if you take another medication here, you're not starting from zero, because you've already got stuff in your system. You're starting from here, and so it then drops up higher, and it stays in your system for longer. So that's what you're trying to tailor. And when you take a top of a medication, it's keeping that level constantly above that therapeutic line. That's the aim. That's why you take antibiotics two or three times a day, because what's happening is that when this is dropping down, you're taking your next dose to make sure that the level is always above the level that you need to actually have an effect. That's what you're constantly trying to do when you're taking more medication. The other factor that goes on here is what's called the half-life. So the half-life of the drug is how long it takes for 50% of that to be broken down and got rid of. So methylphenidate, which is the most commonly used one, immediate release, is four hours. That's two hours, sorry, so it's out of system in four hours. So it's two hour half-life. So what it means is a bit like paracetamol, which is why I use an example. It's in your system quickly, works quickly, but within four hours it's gone. So, you know, that's not school day. So the reason you have long-acting drugs is to try and modify the release to replicate 
bad effects, so you don't have to take it more than once. And that's why you have all these long Epson drugs the other end. Concerta was one of the first ones which people came up with. And none of these, all of these drugs, very kind of Epson Concerta, or their equivalents, there's lots of cheaper equivalents now, all of them. Your question? I'm mm, just trying to work out which drug. Okay. Which one do you mean? Um, Listex. That's this one. Airbands. So they're yeah, airbands. And how long should these longer version drugs be lasting for? They vary about the person. But, yeah, okay. So concerta lasts for about, and most of the ones last about 8,000 to about 9,000 to 12,000. Because my son is on Most Connect XL, <coughs> and he has to have a top up at lunchtime because by lunchtime, so let's come, come on to that. So one of them, um, so basically, these are all based on lethal honey. Active drug, whether it's many kind of your start or concerta, is still lethal honey. Stimulant, yeah. They're all, these are all stimulants. These are all stimulants. Well, these are all stimulants. These are not stimulants. Okay. And is there ever a scenario where you're taking both? You can do. So I no, would. That, but that really has to be specialist initiation. You know, I, what we're pushing for is that primary care can manage the simple stuff. Most people are just on one. Mm -hmm. And if you're getting on two or combinations, you have more of a resistant pattern and you really need to know what you're doing. And so I will use two, very rarely three, because then you have to think about mechanism of actions, the interaction between them, what else is going on and what you're doing. And so it's not as straightforward to use one. <laughs> so the stimulants, what you're trying to do is to get that level and that dose right so it works for you. So what I tend to think about is what is your, this is the lifestyle choice that we're talking about. So Concerta, you know, how are their equivalent? What it has, it has 22% of it is immediately released and then the rest, 78%, comes in a second block after about three, two or three hours. And so you get a small peak and it mimics the same dropping off, then you get another peak. All of these, same drug, different mechanism of release. Some have um, some coatings which break down the gastric acid at different rates. What Concerta has is a gel which melts at a certain rate and then squeezes it out. Now they will vary. They're supposed to be identical from person to person, but it's not exactly identical. Your metabolisms are all different. You know, that's the problem, is that it's roughly eight hours. It's not exactly eight hours. Some people are six, some people are ten. And that's the problem, is that there is variation. That again is a description. What's the time um, in terms of the burn curve to get above the line? Um, to work the concerta drug? The so the concerta again, is immediate release is 22% straight, 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 then, yeah. straight off, as yeah. you get that first 22%. And, but if you've got an 18 milligram tablet, that's only 4 milligrams, or 2 milligrams that come out, no, it's yeah, 4 milligrams first. Yeah. So that's not high dose. If you think about immediate release, you would start with type 5 twice a day. And so you're getting less than that baseline. And when you're trying to titrate the same, if you go for an immediate release of that, you titrate the initial dose to that. And so what you'll find is some people end up with a lot more overall. As in a high prescription dose. So if I'm saying to you 22%, yep. it comes out straight away, and I'm titrating your initial release to make sure you get above the line. Like that. Yeah? And so, and that's going to be 4, 8, 12. Mm -hmm. And I need to get you to 10, say you're on 10 milligrams twice a day. Mm -hmm. The first one's 12, and that's 22%. You're going to be on about 50 or 60 milligrams later on. So your overall, instead of being 10, it's about 70. Mm -hmm. So you're more likely to get those side effects. So you have to bear that in mind. Side effects being the blood. But for kids, it doesn't matter so much for adults, yes, blood pressure and other things. But you can still feel tense, you can still have those other issues that will go on. Mm -hmm. So you're always balancing these kind of things. And so it's never straightforward. But it, what it does mean, you should have one off dose in the day. <coughs> and so you give it to them. So, for example, you go to school, you give it about 8 o'clock, we walk out the door, by the time they get into school and class of staff, it's kicking in. You know, and it lasts until it finishes. Again, Medicare yeah, was designed for the German, it's a German market. And so in Germany, it starts at 7 o'clock, so straight on. And, but it, it doesn't last as long. So, so with you can see it, you can't really see it. And what you've got is this is a biphasic release. And so you have a little peak and then another one later on. With Medikinet, what happens here is it goes up but then turns off. Okay. 
Same short as Gordon. Yeah, that's why you do it twice. Mm. Is that because it's not lasting. So, <clears throat> so for adults, the discussion we tend to have is are you the sort of job where you come in in the morning, make the coffee, do your emails, and then start to do stuff, uh, but then you need to concentrate for the rest of the day, in which case I'd use a profile a bit like Inserta, and you can use any of them. If you're the sort of person who comes in and from the first minute you have to be on it, then I'd think about maybe kind of it, but I may have to give it to you twice. Um, I can see the stimulus, metal, something like that. And um, what's the difference, main difference between the two? Just the but they're different compounds. Okay. They work on different different receptors, slightly different profiles. Okay. This one's more effective, they do work on more receptors. Okay. Um, so um, you'd start on the meth on the first. Yes, start on there. Nice would suggest we start here, but generally it varies. Do you get instances where one works and the other doesn't, or in the yeah, sometimes. Yeah. And the side effects, um, <coughs> In fact, the gut or the stomach lining where these things being released into it, or not? Is it just purely? GI or side effects are the most common, so gut side effects. You know, anything which is called a sympathetic side effect. You know, think about when you are tense. You know, you go to the toilet more, you gust your cat's it makes it all that sort of stuff. What adrenaline does is making you do it. And so it will make you have more lines of diarrhea and stuff like this. Yeah, but we're, we're also longer term, like it's a bad example, but if you're taking things back, back pain tablets like the proxy. That eats at the lining of the stomach. So with these ta tablets, they're not known to do that. Okay, it's different kind of thing. So you're getting what's called sympathetic side effect, and so that's the kind of stuff that you would look at. GI motility is a common thing. GI motility, yeah. so yeah. that's a very true. That's right. anxiety and because it makes you tense, makes you ready to go, and that's that's just what it does because it's affecting anything that no adrenaline will normally no affect. That's its effect. Like I said, there's no such thing as a side effect, it's just effects. We choose to call things side effects, we, not, we don't find them beneficial. Other things we probably want. Now, I've used side effects in theory to have beneficial effects on people because you know that's what we want. Not with these drugs, but with other drugs. You know, the so-called side effects can have beneficial effects in their mind. And, and, and with the effects, um, some of what we say relates to why you're on the drug, um, like maybe faster bowel movements or vomiting potentially. But um, there might be an immediate effect, but are there any effects that are lasting so you stop taking the drugs when you get to adulthood, for example? They're not supposed to cause addiction in that sense. Sorry, sorry. They're not supposed to cause those kind of long-term addictions or negative effects. Now, if it affects your growth because of appetite suppression or whatever, then yes, that's a permanent. But it's to do with the nature, so that's why you're monitoring these things. Yeah, okay. Okay, that's why you have to have an ongoing monitoring, whether it's a GP doing it or us doing it. Yeah. You're monitoring for physical side effects, which is the unintended consequence of taking these long term. Okay. It's an appetite side of yeah, things. Because, this is where um, these things were first used. Okay, but it, is it because you are more alert and able to it, get it? It decreases your appetite. Your appetite. Your appetite. <laughs> yeah, so it blocks the area of your brain that makes you hungry. Okay. <clears throat> and so what then that's doing is that your appetite, you feel less hungry as a result. It's not that you can't eat, mm -hmm. you just have that loss of appetite. But it's a side effect of the yeah, they're, they're just what it's doing is blocking the cell. Okay. It's, uh, it's not necessarily direct, but no. it's yeah. um, And so that's the kind of stuff that we're trying to look at. It's about an effect because it's working on those systems in the body. Mm -hmm. Dexamphetamine works slightly different receptor profile, but then will up the effect. Now, it is probably more effective, but also has more side effects because it's more effective, it's going to impact more. And so, with this day, increasingly, in adults, it's first line. Now, balance works a six hour half life, so it works the longer acting off about 12 hours. And so you've got more of that in there. So again, if you're choosing which one you're going to use, then you're getting into these second and third line medication, um, where atomoxetine, these are all stimulants, they control drugs. You know, that's the risk with this is that these are controlled drugs, you know, you have to have a license to be able to do it, and it's not straightforward. That's why a lot of GPs are slightly wearing it, because they're not used to using a controlled drug. These are not. And so, in a sense, it's easy to prescribe. I can only give you 28 days and send you three months of that. But that's the best thing. They still abuse some of them, but not, they're not in the same way. Asimoxetine is an old antidepressant, which we found, which works in a similar way to other 
antidepressants in terms of noradrenaline reuptake. That's why it's not as effective on some as, as these ones, top the stimulants, but they still work. Guamfacine well, works in a different way. So, the most potent, we're talking about combinations, guamfacine well, and these the steps. They work, they're the most potent combination. So, they're working on different systems. And if you're going to combine them, but you, know, you have to really then be under the care of people like me or our specialist team because that is getting a little more complicated. And only when that's really stable for a period of time do you think about passing on. It's the really the ones who most people are fairly stable fairly quickly. And then you pass on them. Um, and can I just ask about dosage? So obviously your QB test is quite an interesting one for an adult. But in, in adolescence, is it just literally by reported behaviour? It depends on where you are. So the kids, and so if you go to Berkshire, Berkshire uses QB. Mm -hmm. And so it depends on different regions have different approaches to this. And Surrey chose not to, because it's 15,000 pounds per region. And we chose to use it, um, but the choice in cans was actually we'd rather get an extra practitioner. Mm -hmm. It's more complicated now it's because of different stories and there's different things, so we felt it was important addition that we needed to have um, access to, but it's not a cheap one. And so there are choices that you make with this kind of stuff. So, so if you're trying to work out dosage with, with an adolescent, it, it's about... It's, it's what they tell you. It's, or is it about what other people tell you? Both. Both. You would hope for an adolescent that they were eloquent enough to ask answer questions. So, um, I have teenagers, so I that. Yeah. Um, and so, you know, you'd hope to get that, but you also get a subjective, objective opinion from people around you. And so that's what you'd hope you would do, is take a bit of both. But I have a, a question on, st on students again. Mm -hmm. um, in our kind of research, um, looking at what happens to children ADHD and adulthood, and what, what, you know, if they get labelled and, and you know, have the, the bad experiences that they, they come onto drugs um, in later on in life, um, You're saying what? Use illicit drugs? Yes, correct, yeah. Okay. So if, if, and this is just a question for awareness, I suppose, if, if they're having stimulants to deal with ADHD um, as, a, as a youngster, uh, they, they reduce the drug dependence. Yeah, but when they reach into adulthood, yeah. if you don't have the. Most people who are ADHD. Yeah, so I wasn't diagnosed when I was 39, yeah. and I'm quite open, and I have an amphetamine habit. Yeah. Yeah. So, so most I self medicated. That's the point. So most people who 